I've, I've got to mention that it, it seems that every year election day rolls around and there's a point where you think, gosh, that's a way off yet. And now we're down to one week to go and this week is going to pass uh, very, very quickly. We'll be seeing a few of the candidates dropping in the studio with us over the next few days. And there are a lot of issues that have been, call them subsumed in media this year because of uh, the Trump-Clinton race has sucked all of the oxygen, it seems, out of the room at times. But uh, we have a lot of people, of course, who are running on the local level, on the state level, and there are some important issues that they're dealing with that may have, in fact, some greater impact on all of your lives uh, than, in many cases, what happens at the national level. And we're joined in the studio during this segment of the program by State Representative Stephen Hartkin, uh, running for re-election after, what, now eight years in the legislature? I've been four terms, eight years. Thank you for having me, Bill. Yeah, and we want to point out uh, it's been an exciting year. We got through a primary season, and then summertime seemed to be somewhat quiet on the political level. And then, boy, I'll tell you what, October really heated up uh, for, for all of you who are running for state legislative races. Uh, that's true. I think uh, there were some primary contests, and I had one back in the spring. And then uh, this summer it was uh, sort of started off uh, – that way, and it's kind of increased uh, through the fall. But that's a pretty normal pattern as well. I don't want to waste your time on these process questions. So there's got to be an agenda that each and every one of you have. I mean, if you look down the road at next session, what it is that's going to be important, what you want to accomplish. Well, I'm the common sense conservative candidate in this race. I favor lower taxes, limited government, uh, less regulation. I think we'll keep up with our spending on on education side. I've been accused of being against that, but that's not the case. Uh, we could spend more, but we don't have it. And uh, I think we should avoid going into additional taxes or additional debt uh, to fund any particular role in government. Why Idaho ranks one of the best in the nation in terms of uh, a limited, limited debt, debt to cash flow ratio. We're like number one or number two. And I think we should keep that. We should keep that. We should not use debt, and we should not spend what we don't have. Uh, so I think those are issues that will come up. I, I've been an advocate for lowering tax rates for some time now, but the state is taking in more revenue than we need, and I think that ought to stay in people's pockets. So I'll work on that issue this uh, this winter. You go back to really the beginning of that recession in, in your service in Boise, and a lot of states around the country tried all sorts of either slapdash methods or emergency methods. And I guess the idea was here, just retrench, wait it out, and then and, and, and that we would be better off in the long run. We lost about a third of state revenue in the recession. We went from roughly $3 billion of general fund to about $2.2 billion. And it happened over 18 months. It was in one fell swoop. Um, and we responded to that pretty well. One, we held the line dramatically on cost increases. If people came for increases like the teachers' union or the various entities in, around the state, we just said you can't, can't do that right at this time. We also had good rainy day funds, about $400 million worth, that we were able to tap. And we drew that down to uh, almost zero uh, in order to maintain essential state services, keep the schools operating, uh, water empl employees, uh, Department of uh, Corrections, and so forth. And then as the economy began to recover in, in uh, 2012 and revenue began to come back, we opened the spigot a little bit to sort of begin to restore what we had. And actually, education has led the way out of that, uh, out of that recession. We've given almost 20% public school funding increase in the last three years. Uh, my opponent says that's not enough. Well, okay, uh, that arguably you could say we should put more, but where would it come from? It would have to come from increased taxes. I prefer to do what uh, what a cautious conservative approach is here is to allow the growth of the state economy to fund the future. We're already up eight and a half percent this in the first three months of this budget year over last year. Last year we were up about five percent. The year before that about five and a half. So we're moving ahead quite nicely, and actually education is rising. Education funding is rising faster than the uh, than the economy is, or the population. I know that 20-some uh, years ago, I was working at a radio station, and we had, as a guest on air one day, Mario Cuomo, and a caller got through and said, you know, sort of complaining about the size of his property taxes that were funding schools, and the governor said to him, 
are you, uh, what do you have against uh, educating our children, which is a rhetorical turn to try to imply that the questioner is somehow out to get kids. And I know how that works in politics. And you've been, I think, a victim of that to some degree this year, too, as well, because nobody then ever turns around and says, well, what about that taxpayer? What are they going through? What are their costs? Because uh, they're paying more for you know, so many things in life, and many of them can't afford to send their own kids on for secondary education. Why is it no one wants to ever talk about that side of it? Well, because if you talk about that side of it, then it comes to the issue of, of community responsibility for the educational money that they, that they have. Uh, the legislature is very generous to the state in education, but it also gives people at the local community the ability uh, to bond additional money through supplemental levies. And uh, many school systems do that, including Twin Falls. Uh, the Twin Falls district has been very, very generous in that regard, the patrons of the district. Some districts are not so much. They're, they're tighter. Their economies are not, are not as strong. And unless so, uh, there are some occasionally that are turned down, but not very many. Uh, the, the, the record shows that if you ask the patrons for additional money and you make the case for why that's needed, most patrons will vote for that. And that's a pretty good system. It's called local control. Uh, sometimes local control is interpreted to mean I want local control when the state sends me the money, but I don't want local control when I have to write it myself in my own, out of my own checkbook. Well, I think the legislature has been pretty good in, in giving communities that power, and many communities have, have used it well, and, and Twin Falls is an example. We've not turned down a supplemental levy in this community in at least 25 years. Uh, they're always, almost always passed. If you want to grab the headset, I believe we have a caller with us. And uh, get to the caller in just a moment. We do want to point out it's 913. You're listening to News Radio 1310, KLIX, and newsradio1310.com. Don't worry, I do that three times a day. Um, where <laughs> the microphones here are a little uh, sometimes on the too large size, and uh, sometimes they get in the way of the show. We have a caller with us. Caller, you're up next. You're on the air with Representative Hartkin. Yeah. Oh. Uh I was just listening to your radio, and when he was saying that the boat is usually, I, I live in Twin Falls County, and when they say that the voters usually go along with the levy, most of the voters in Twin Falls County are not property owners. And so, yeah, they go along with levies with the schools because that's nothing out of their pocket. Uh, I've always been this balance in the budget, things like that. There's plenty of money that gets wasted throughout the county, the city, the state, federal government, all the way through. And you see 10 people standing watching one job be at work, whether it's a school. Uh, you've always got extra people all the time around that is expanding instead of actually doing the work. There's plenty of money there, but they found all that without doing bond work, without adding things to it, like Bali School District, and they put the new high school in. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, I think we got the gist of that, right? I think so. Uh, I think our caller is correct that the property tax levy falls on property tax owners, obviously, and that people who are not property tax owners don't necessarily pay that money directly, although they do pay it in the form of increased rents and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bigger question that I think he really points to, and that is that what's the right role for government with respect to funding of public education? And I think that's a good question. Uh, philosophically, I think some sort of mix is uh, usually considered to be the right answer. Some from the state, from from local property taxes, some from the federal government, although there's not as much of that as there, as there uh, could be. Uh, but I think, generally speaking, he raises a good question. We have a, a system that basically looks at educational funding and draws from various sources, and he's right that there's some inequity in that. We have another caller with us, I believe, and Caller number two, you're on the air with Representative Hartgen at uh, 916 on KLIX. Go ahead. I would like to make a comment that uh, Talkington, his opponent, uh, has uh, openly to me called any information trying to inform them about the dangers of Islamic Jihad 
and Sharia law and so forth, just called it puke. There are a lot of people in this community that are concerned about refugees and the potential terrorist activities. Um, I just want everybody to be aware of that. They're, the Talkingtons are very much in favor of the refugee program, and I'd like Steve to comment about uh, the refugee situation in general and uh, realizing that it's a theocracy, not really a religion, and doesn't come under the protection of the First Amendment. Thank by you very much. By the way, it's the first time we've heard your opponent's name today. So, Well, thank you for, <laughs> for the call. My position on the Refugee Center has been uh, consistent since the issue rose up in this community, what, a year and a half, two years ago. And that is that I support the center. I think it's done good work over the years and has helped settle a good, a good number of people into the United States successfully. But I am also concerned about the vetting process that I don't think is adequate at the state level or the federal level. It's really nothing that the local level has much to do with. And so I support the call of the governor and that of 30 other states uh, for uh, moratoriums uh, from particular places where uh, certain activities are occurring around the world. I think it's just common sense that we have some better vetting from people coming from those from those areas of the world. That doesn't mean we exclude them. It doesn't mean that we uh, prohibit their right to become Americans. But I do think that the right to be an American is the right to assimilate to American values. Teddy Roosevelt said that very clearly back over 100 years ago, that as we have an immigration flow into the United States, we can expect that those people would become American and would adhere to American values. And to the extent that uh, betting will weed out those who don't, I think that's a good idea. Uh, it doesn't seem right to me, and it doesn't seem like good policy, uh, to put people into a community where there are substantial questions about, about their being here. And I think that the, the governor is right on that. Uh, 30 other states have the same position. The Congress, uh, the House, has uh, called for the same thing. Uh, but under this current administration, they've taken the view that we're going to uh, allow people to enter the country without, uh, without adequate sc screening. When the people were here last summer from the federal agency, I talked with them about that, and, uh, and they admitted that they, they didn't have a perfect system. And I think that the Congress resolution is correct, that no single person should come into this country unless that individual has been vetted individually and that they will assert that that person is correct and will assimilate into the country correctly. Can you stick around for five more minutes? I uh, sure can. We've got a short break coming up. We're going to have more telephone calls by the looks of things. Uh, we want to mention Representative Stephen Harkin is in the studio with us this morning. It's 42 on our way probably into the low 50s today, 20 minutes after 9 o'clock. And you're listening to News Radio 1310, KLIX, NewsRadio1310.com. Bill Colley on Top Story. Our guest in studio is State Representative Stephen Hartgen, and uh, he's here for a few more minutes with us. And we're talking a little bit. We were talking too, as well, about education funding, which has become seems to be it's become a bigger issue in the campaign on this local level than maybe it is statewide. I can recall, and of course, you're listening to News Radio 1310, KLIX, and NewsRadio1310.com. 41 at 923. Bill Colley with you as well today. Ten years ago or so, I was hosting a radio show in New York State, and I remember at the time some figures came out, and state of neighboring Utah spent about $6,000 a year at the time educating students, and in New York they were spending about 15000 so it was well more than double. And the test scores were higher in Utah than they were in New York, which when you come down to it, it shows you that you can spend a lot of money, but you don't necessarily get a great deal of success. Well, I think that's right. Test scores are often cited as a measure of uh, improvement against other states, whereas inadequacy of spending or the amount per student is often cited by the other side as saying, well, we're not doing enough. And that we've had, just to some degree, that same argument in, uh, in Idaho. Test scores in Idaho tend to be pretty good. We're usually in the top 10, 12 states in the nation. But our funding level is closer to Utah than, say, D.C. or California or Illinois or New York. Uh, and there are many reasons for that. Some of them are cultural, no doubt, and, and there are, it's not really, uh, you know, it's a long topic that we don't have to spend a lot of time on. In Idaho, you know, the revenue, the revenue is rising rapidly. Education funding is almost $350 million higher in the proposed budget year than it was three years ago. So we're adding this next proposal that from uh, the superintendent of schools 
She's proposing a budget that's almost $100 million higher than the previous year. And I think we'll be able to get to that pretty close, the 6.6%. That'll give us about $350 million over three years increase, uh, 20% or better than 20%. So if that's not enough, I guess citizens ought to ask, you know, what is what is enough if that's not enough? Uh, K-12 has been very, very well served, I think, by the legislature in this regard. So I don't know how anybody could look at state funding of education and say, well, you're not giving us enough. We want even more. I had a legislator, a Democrat, many years ago tell me, he said, these schools can't get enough money. In other words, you could keep giving them everything and more and more and more, and it doesn't necessarily mean there's ever going to be an end to it. Well, I, I'm not sure about that argument, but in clearly in the environment that we're in, where the state is, is growing, the revenue is growing, the economy is growing a uh, hickly buck, that there's edu- education money is flowing back to the communities from the state every year. What don't I understand about that pattern? That seems to me like a pretty good pattern. We're keeping it in control. We're not, we're not doing a runaway spending, but we're also funding the needs of the state. We do have more kids coming in. We do have some needs in certain areas like STEM education and discretionary funding and things like that, and, and we're trying to address those. But the argument that we're not doing anything is simply false. We are. Got about two minutes to go. We'll squeeze in one last caller and just want to remind the caller we're to, to two minutes, so make it a question versus a statement, and uh, that way you can get a response, too, as well. Uh, you're on the air with State Representative Stephen Hartkin. Go ahead. Steve. Has anybody figured out that these these elections, these levy elections, cost money? And there was an insinuation in the paper about a ninety-four thousand dollar payoff to this lady that left the education thing in in Twin Falls. Anything on that? Thanks, Steve. Well, I, I won't touch the uh, the issue of the payout because it is a secret matter. At least the at least the personnel issues behind it. Uh, but I think people realize that when they go and vote for a levy, they're voting for to take money out of their own pockets. And it's a reflection of the commitment and the sense that people have that, yes, Twin Falls is doing a good job with educating our kids, that people are willing to say, yes, I'm willing to put more money forward, whether it's for capital improvements, new schools, or whether it's for supplemental levy, which traditionally goes into staffing and other matters. That's a local decision that local patrons make. And I think Twin Falls has been very generous uh, to the community and to their to their patrons and to their school system. Uh, and I'm not sure that we ought to go every year with the levy, but we seem to come up with them. It's been, as I said, at least 25 years since one's been turned down. I don't actually know that one's been turned down uh, since the early 1980s. you got to point out before we wrap up uh, that uh, you are on the web. For people who'd like to know more, uh, where would you send them? www.stephenhartgen.com has my all of the information and, and my position on many of the issues. Look forward to your support uh, on Election Day. Thank you very much for having me. And we want to point out you're on Facebook, too, as well. I am on Facebook as well. Seems that in this day and age that this social media <laughs> thing, you have to have six or eight different profiles in various places. It does seem that way. Thank you. For, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I want to thank you for coming by, and just to let you know, Lance Clow, who's, of course, uh, your your uh, colleague in the same district, will be with us on Thursday morning, Okay. and he's going to be talking about HJR5, which I, I read the other day where someone says it's an obscure ballot measure, but because of all the attention it's got, it's not obscure any longer. So. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> we want to thank you again. We've got a break coming up in just a moment. It's 930, and it's 42 at KLIX.